What's up everybody? I'm Alex650 and I'm going to teach you some stuff about photography, hopefully. So when people ask how do I take a good photo, it's kind of, it's extremely hard for me to just give you something or just say here try this or uh, do this one thing and it's always going to come out great. There is no magic bullet to photography. Just like a lot of things in the world, there's no specific thing to make it just perfect. Photographers don't walk out of their house and say, I'm going to take a picture of a sunset. They look at the sun and go, okay, and about click and cool, gold, and walk home. There are multiple parts to it. So photography is a very relative thing. And relative meaning that when you're trying to learn this, things shift on you constantly. So trying to get somewhere or do something specific, it's always going to be different from the last time you did something in that instance. Light's always changing. It's either brighter or darker in this situation, or you're photographing something with a brighter or darker color, or the contrast is different, or all sorts of different things. I will be going over most of the main parts about photography. I'm not going to get into every little bit of detail and all that kind of stuff, but I'm going to give you enough that you need to start going to where you want to go. If you want to stay in automatic mode and all that kind of stuff, that's awesome. You do you. I'm going to give you the tools and information that you need to actually take photographs that you like or that you want. I will be able to give you the information you need to look at something and go, I want to do this and I want it to come out like that, so this is what I need to do. Let's get started. JPEG versus RAW. I get this question a lot. Why should I shoot RAW when JPEGs just come out of my camera and they're nice, they're pretty and whatever? Think of it as a pizza, right? If you order a pizza from Domino's or Pizza Hut or wherever the nearest pizza chain is from you, and you get, let's say it's a square pizza, and I have 10 slices, right? So 10 slices all the way down, and I've got this entire pizza, and I'm like, I want pepperoni, and I want mushrooms, and I want olives, and I want ham. So one slice has each kind of thing. JPEG is taking that entire pizza and taking slices of it out. You don't get as much information, but you get a smaller file, and something you can work with, you can't make it absolutely huge, like you can't blow it up to poster size and it's awesome. You just basically get what you get and it looks great on Facebook or something small or like a monitor of some sort. It's fine. For your phone, it's fine. But shooting raw gives you the entire pizza. So think of it as when you try and take a photo and get that perfect exposure, you're capturing as much light and as much detail as you can. So when you look at things like your histogram, that'll basically tell you how things go as far as how much you caught. And if you see any spikes or it's shooting more towards the lower end of the histogram, it's usually not a good thing. You want your data to be in a nice mound in the middle, which I know doesn't happen really hardly at all. But a perfect exposure will be the most amount of data for what you're actually shooting. That way there's more to work with. First thing I'm going to get into is just a little light brush over of f-stop, shutter speed, and ISO. Your camera's built that it has a lens and a sensor and a mirror between all that. That mirror, or your shutter, light goes through the lens, hits the mirror, goes up into a prism, that's what you see. When you hit the button and tell that thing to take a picture, that mirror moves up out of the way, a shutter opens for a certain amount of time, light comes in, exposes the sensor, that's your net of light. So think of it as like you're catching fish, you're catching as much data as you can, and light hits it, it takes the picture, shutter closes, mirror closes, and that's what you get. So you can make this thing open longer, open shorter, depending on how things go. So ISO is how reactive that sensor is. If I have a little bit of light out in my room, so let's say it's very, very dark, I'm going to shoot at a higher ISO because the little bit of light I would get, I want the sensor to react more and be able to record more. If I have a ton of light, let's say it's high noon, sunny day, super bright everywhere, I'm not going to need that much reaction out of my sensor. So what I'm going to do is lower that down. The higher the number, 
the more it will capture or the more sensitive it is, the lower the number, the less sensitive it is. Everything else in photography is set, I believe, opposite of that. Can't remember off the top of my head. But, so that being said, when I take my picture, depending on ISO, that's how things work. There is drawbacks to everything though. So your push-pull in photography, which this is with everything, the higher the number of ISO, the more it will create things called artifacts, or uh, basically what it looks like is um, crazy colored pixels. So you'll notice there's like these rainbow streaks in your picture or rainbow dots, uh, depending on how long you expose for. So if I have an ISO of 3200, so let's say I take a Canon 5D Mark I, and I take a picture at the highest ISO and it's the really, really dark room. Let's say it's your apartment and there's candlelight and there's somebody next to the candle and you're like, oh, that, this look cool. You shoot it and it's just for some reason there's like glints in the eyes and all that kind of stuff and there's little dots everywhere and you don't know what that's from. That specifically is what that's from. The lower the number, the harder it is to shoot. But you have less of those artifacts. Moving on to f-stop. f-stop, in your lens, you have an iris. If you take off your lens and look into it, you have this thing that looks like a giant constricted door, basically. And it has a little tiny hole in it. So the lower the number, the wider that gets. The higher the number, the lower that gets. So an f22 is something that's super small, and an f1.8 or 1.4 is really, really wide open. The reason we have this is because it is a depth of field thing, and it is an amount of focus thing, and an amount of light thing. Aperture is one of the hardest things to learn. Everything else is pretty simple. If you can master aperture, everything will be a cakewalk to you. Depth of field works off of if I have a very, very high aperture, or sorry, very wide aperture and a low number. So let's say I'm shooting at a 1.8, for instance, uh, which 1.8 is a great, great lens quality. So I have that open at a 1.8. I'm not going to need a lot of light because a lot of light's going through. So think of it as a faucet and your sensor is a cup. If I have a lot of light going through, I, I could turn on the faucet at full blast for a second and all that water goes into my glass and then I shut it off. But I got enough. If it's at a really low, or sorry, really high number, really low amount of light coming through, that light, or sorry, my, my picture will filter in like a trickle. My light won't be that much. So I have to shove all that through that pipe. It's not, it's not a lot. So usually you're gonna have to lengthen your shutter speed. Which brings me into shutter speed. Shutter speed is basically how fast that curtain moves from your sensor. So if I want it to move away for like two seconds, I can tell my camera to take a picture that's two seconds long. If I'm taking a picture of somebody's face or something like that, if I'm, I take a picture that's two seconds long, chances are it's going to be blurry around the eyes. The entire thing is going to be blurry because no one stands still for two seconds. No one. You can't even take a picture by hand for two seconds and have that happen. So shooting at a faster number, like let's say 1 80th of a second or 1 25th of a second or 2 50th of a second, that means it will let in less light, but it will stop motion. So that being said, now you know how to freeze motion. I will go into these more and more the further we get along, but this is just a basic overview of everything in the camera right now. Manual mode is what you will be shooting in. And you will also be shooting an aperture priority, and you will also be shooting in shutter priority. So shutter priority is what we're going to go through right now. And shutter priority is basically a, set your camera and play around with it. Take pictures of cars moving by or something that's moving constantly, and I want you to try and freeze the motion, and I want you to try and blur the motion a little, and I want you to blur the motion a lot. So you're going to take three pictures as far as a work assignment. So set your camera to something that's very, very, very long exposure. So maybe like a second long, because if I move my hand like yay, and I go one one thousand, from here to here is how fast my hand, or how far my hand moves. So that entire trail 
is going to be a motion blur. Light hits the sensor from my finger, and as my finger moves, the light hits the sensor again from that finger, and as it moves, it does it again. So that's how it records the entire length of time. That being said, if I wanted to make it look like I stopped in the middle of it, like he got a baseball player on the, on the pitcher's mound, and he's about to throw the ball, and the ball has just left his hand, and you want to freeze that. That is how you do that. I would say like one five hundredth of a second, or maybe even faster, because they throw like 70 mile an hour fastballs, 90 mile an hour fastballs. So if I want to freeze that motion, that is a perfect example of how I would do that. If you have something like cars and you want them to look parked on a freeway, I would just jack up the shutter speed really, really high and then just really quick, shoot, you're done. You understand how that works. That's easy. Well, if you want like a little bit of motion, what do you do? You're going to need a tripod or some place to set the camera down and you're going to have to let it shoot, and then see how fast the cars go. If the car's going 70 miles an hour, and you do probably a 1 50th of a second, or maybe a quarter of a second would be a great idea. That would give you enough blur to look like it was traveling, but it's not a complete, like, it's going out of this world kind of thing. So go ahead and try to take those three pictures, see what you get, come back.